Uh, okay, hi. Um, I don't have anybody join, joining me yet for the uh, help session, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, record a few things um, in case some people are wanting to look at this afterwards. So, you know, my plan, unless I get some um, people show up for some questions, um, is, is I did want to review the assignment three. I had one or two things that I wanted to point out, um, although I, I mostly point out the things I'm going to talk about here in the um, announcement. So you can also read there. Um, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about recursion in the assignment four as well. So that was kind of my plan to, to get started with those two things. Um, and oh, uh, yeah, before I move on, um, there was an announcement about this video series here um, that um, I recommend. I'm, I'm going to try and put up uh, recommended alternative videos from this for our units for the class as well. So there, there's some good um, videos in the series, uh, including for oops, including for um, this first week here, first three weeks, four weeks of our class here. Uh, in particular, um, what I mentioned in there, if it, it's really in the form of one big long video, so it's like almost ten hours in length. Uh, and and the, the only good way to go to things is you have to go to, you have to show more here, and they do have links to, it was really, you know, a series of, of lectures or topics, uh, but put all together into one video here. So um, I had recommended for these first two weeks that you kind of look at the first two videos here. So just kind of an overview of introduction to ASS to, to supplement the, the lecture videos that I had. Um, and then especially like last week, we went over our own list type when we were talking about classes. So there's another um, discussion and development of a list type using an array like we did, using an array to keep a list of items. So, so it's kind of good to compare on there. So uh, to tell you the truth then, like after that, I mean, in our class, uh, we're going to get to actual data types. Um, Kind of after the um, um, after the midterm. So for the next few weeks, we're really going to be getting to well, recursion this week, and to things that are um, really analysis of algorithms. So, but then after that, we get back into data structure. So linked lists, um, queues, and stacks. They cover all these things and trees. So we'll look at all of those. So there'll be some good videos for those things as well. But. Um, but yeah, just to kind of show you, um, looking at, at our content, um, we're working up to our first test. It's actually coming quick, so you might want to be thinking about that and asking questions about it. But basically, we do recursion and searching and sorting, which are all kind of algorithmic. You know, we're, we're kind of um, concentrating on algorithms the next three weeks. Um, and then in particular, a, a real quick introduction to what is known as algorithmic complexity or the analysis of algorithms, which will give us some of the tools um, to analyze the trade offs of implementing things like linked lists and stacks and things in different ways. Okay. But yeah, those videos that I pointed you out, pointed out to you, kind of talk a little bit about that even in the first um, uh, two. They get start getting to talking about these. Um, the, the comparison of, of different ways to implement, you know, um, and then especially when we get to linked lists. So compare implementing a list as a linked list of items versus as an, uh, a static array. So, um, but, but yeah, all that kind of stuff we'll, we'll be getting to uh, in this class as well. So, um, all right, so let me start by maybe 10 minutes about assignment three here, um, go over a couple of things. So um, I'm, I'm going to be using the uh, posted solution that I had. Uh, let me see here, make certain everything ran, um, built and ran as usual. So yeah, um, so I'm passing all the 56 um, assertions in the six different test case with the solution, including through add. So most people, um, uh, so it was pretty common for people to get everything but add. They'd gotten up to that point, which makes sense because it did uh, add took um, some work to get implemented. Um, so most of the member functions up to that were relatively simpler, except for maybe a pin digit also um, took some um, um, some code to implement it. So, 
Uh, we go ahead and open up Visual Studio here. So, close these all off. Make certain I got my assignment three solution this time that we're going to look at. <coughs> so I'll open up the tests and I'll open up the header file and I'll open up the source file. Put that the implementation file. Put that over here. So hopefully at this point everybody is getting uh, a good understanding from um, example of why we split like into what I call the header file, which is really kind of just the declaration or the interface or the API of like your class and um, the signatures of the member functions of the class. And then into an implementation file. So this is where you actually implement these member functions, right? And, and this is pretty standard to split the things like this because if I'm gonna be using this large integer, I'm gonna be reusing this, this class that I develop, um, all I want to do is just include the header file. This gives me the this gives the compiler the information about the the definitions of the class and the definition of the member functions of the class that can be you know that are public that can be publicly invoked um, our, our class here. So, um, so I'll leave it up to you. You know, if you had questions, since nobody came here to ask about them, if you had questions about implementing the constructor. So the, the constructor that you were supposed to do should have looked pretty similar to the, to the constructor that I gave you that constructed from a value, but a little bit simpler because all you had to do was correctly dynamically allocate a, a digits array and then copy the, the digits, digit by digit, from the, um, from the um, parameter that you were given as input into this, you know, the, the, the array of digits that you dynamically allocate. Okay? And the way I showed is the way that I prefer to do these things. So I like to have the names the same and then to differentiate between the number of digits, which is the parameter, and the num digits, which is um, the member variable. We, we, we say, so this will assign the parameter into this, is mem this object's, this instance's member variable. And, and then this will allocate an array of integers and sign and assign the resulting um, pointer to that block of memory that was allocated into this is this instance's array of digits, right? And then in the loop, we copy the parameter digits uh, from the index to this uh, um, array's block of memory that we just allocated. All right. <laughs> So again, I know a lot of people haven't seen code like this before, but once you get used to this, this um, is going to be much more likely to be what you would see experienced C++ programmers making use of this um, and, and, and variable names like this. My only, um, one, one of the comments I gave to some people, a lot of people was, you know, to use meaningful variable names. So one of my kind of secondary goals of this class is, um, to teach good programming um, practices and programming fundamentals by, by demonstrating them in solutions and things and through feedback. So I might actually, if somebody um, had given this to me, um, I might have given a, um, you know, um, a, a, a suggestion that it might be better not to rely on abbreviation. So, you know, so just, just, just to call that number digits or even number of digits, right? So on the one hand, you know, it's, it's a little more, more typing, but the, <coughs> you, you really don't spend a lot of time when you're writing code, developing code, typing things, right? You spend time thinking about the, the algorithm, about the steps that you need, and actually you usually end up saving time rather than uh, creating more time by making things as meaningful as possible. And, and to, to kind of first degree approximation, what I mean by meaningful is readable, right? So it's readable in the sense of like a, an English speaker being able to look at the code and kind of read it out uh, in general. I mean, not, not an English speak, speaker that doesn't understand programming and, and C++ syntax, but you know, uh, uh, so, you know, 
to an experienced programmer, you know, you read something like this that I'm, I'm, I'm going to iterate over some statements from zero, you know, all the way through the, the uh, possible values of this array, um, presumably. So my index is going to go from zero up to the number of digits in the array. Um, and, and I'm copying the values from my parameter, uh, my array that was passed in as parameter into my local memory. This dynamic object. So anyway, but yeah, I did call it num digits. So, um, here's an example of max digits, which I think was the, um, the, the second, well, the third task. So the first task you had to do was do the two string. So I'll just show that real quickly. So, so here's the, the cleanest way to do that since really the digits in the array, the, the, the digit at index zero represents the ones place or the 10 to the power of zero place in our large integer and the digit at index one is the tens place or 10 to the power of one. So that means that if you iterate through this array backwards, so from the last digit, so the last digit is gonna be at num digits minus one, it's gonna be at that index. So for consistency, I maybe should have called this digit index instead of digit place. Uh, so, I mean, that's another thing. You should be consistent. And, and so that's another thing where I would ding myself on readability here. So if I'm going to use kind of a, a meaningful name, I should probably call that digit index. I, I call it digit place here because it's the, um, um, the, uh, the, the, the digit place. So by that, I'm trying to indicate it's, you know, the, the ones digit 10 to the power of zero or the, the tens digit 10 to the power of one. Uh, yeah, so, so maybe we could have called this something like the um, digit power um, or the, you know, so, so that, that's what we're trying to um, communicate here. So anyway, if you go backwards through this, that way you'll put the, the highest um, magnitude digit to the output string first, and then the next highest and so on down to the, the tens digit, and then finally the ones digit or the ten to the zero. So then you'll end up with your representation as a string in the correct order. Um, and, you know, that will allow you to pass um, all of these tests where we're expecting um, L1, that large integer one, to have a, a value of zero represented as a string with just zero, large integer two to have a value of one, two, three, four, five. So we should get that string back, one, two, three, four, five, um, and so on. Right? And again, you know, make certain... Um, that you are really understanding like these tests. So these tests are really, uh, they, they specify how you need to use the, the classes, you know, the, I mean, the C++ classes for these items and, and the, the, the member functions for the class. So these are really showing you how to use the API that we define uh, for thing classes like this. So, so the, 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 the various member functions you can call for your class here, right? So in, yeah, in this case, in the second one, the, the API is that the, the constructor you were supposed to create, um, you expect an array of digits, but the array of digits is gonna be you know, in reverse in some sense, because again, the 10 to the zero power um, is gonna go uh, at index zero, which is the eight, and then this is 10 to the one power, the 10 digit, and this is 10 to the two or the hundreds digit, and so on up to whatever this is, the million or the 10 millions digit. So if you see the array in this order, you expect that this represents the value 2 billion, 147 million, uh, 800, and, yeah, I got that wrong, but yeah, it represents that number. So, right. Same with this one with even 30 digits, okay. Oh, by the way, I had at least one student um, somewhere, instead of using dynamic memory allocation, had hard-coded an array of like size 30, right. So while that works um, to, I, th I think they had done it in um, the place where you really should have allocated an array, like, like uh, a pin digit, um, you needed to really allocate a new. I mean, if you hard code, uh, instead of dynamically allocating some memory, um, if you had instead, uh, this won't work for this method but use like an array of 30. Um, I mean, that, that would work to pass the tests that I've got, the, the test as written for the most part, although here there would be some other problems, but this, I'm trying to just illustrate 
this idea here, right? But, um, you know, it, it doesn't really pass the real um, purpose of this class, which is it's supposed to be able to re represent a large integer of any arbitrary size. And what you're supposed to be practicing in this assignment is that by using dynamic memory allocation, you can do that. I mean, in theory, you can represent large integers with millions or tens of millions or billions of digits because you're, if you're correctly using dynamic memory allocation wherever you need to, uh, to create an array big enough to hold the digits that you need to represent, okay? So really the only limitation is the size of your uh, physical computer memory, so the amount of RAM, if you are correctly using your dynamic memory allocation, which greatly increases, <coughs> in theory, you know, the, the, the kinds of problems, you, the, the kinds of things you can represent with your large integer than if you have some hard-coded upper limit on the number of digits, like 30 or 100 or 1,000. Um, all right. So that's kind of a bit of an aside. So we, we looked at the, um, the, the constructor, we looked at the two string, um, and then notice this is kind of common. I, I um, you know, create a couple of other large integers that we reuse in multiple test cases. So hopefully everybody understood that. So, you know, if you ask for the, the max digits between the large integer one, which should have a value of zero here, right? And large integer two, which has a value of five, uh, but both of these have one digit. So this represents something with one digit and this represents something with one digit. So that, that's supposed to return a one if they have equal. It's supposed to return the large um, integer, the number of digits in the larger of the two between L1 and L2 here. That's purpose. So again, a lot of these member functions that you wrote, if you didn't quite understand this, um, are things that maybe a user of the large integer class might not actually use very much. And as such, the, these are maybe more likely to be private functions. So, you know, if, if, an, if a user of the large integer never wants to know the number of digits or the maximum number of digits, you know, uh, so we didn't have like a, um, uh, a getter function return the number of digits. Uh, but but if, if the user never needs to use that or know that, that, I mean, that wouldn't be part of the public API. So like max digits, um, maybe all of these, max digits, digit at place, um, certainly a pin digit, like I said, is also a thing that, you know, if, if you're using a large integer, you want to do, you want to, it's an, a representation of an injury. You want to do things like add, subtract, multiply those together, that kinds of things. So arithmetic operations with your large integer. So, you know, these things like, like max digits, maybe especially a pin digit, um, are really probably kind of private to the API. So they help, they make it easier to implement add, um, as I'll show. And if, if you did it, kind of the way I suggested, you can reuse these functions um, to make a fairly small and straightforward implementation of that. Right? So anyway, kind of the point of that is, you know, we talked about classes last week. So, you know, the, usually uh, we talked a little bit about object-oriented analysis and design. So usually all of your data members are going to be private to the class, but, and, and, and a lot of your, your, your functions will be public because those represent the, the, the messages or the way that you can use that class or the public interface, right? But there, there can be also some methods, some member functions that really aren't meant to be used by users of your class, so things outside of your class. So those are uh, internal methods or, you know, you can just make them private if you never, if you want to make certain that, that nobody except your own class, instance of your own class can call those sorts of private member functions, right? It's very common to do that. Um, to, to have some, and we'll be using that a lot. So. <coughs> All right. So anyway, um, if you did this, I, I made use of the max function, which um, is a C++ function that comes from um, the uh, Probably, I don't know if I had included this into the original file that I gave you, but um, you actually have to include the C++ algorithm library, I believe, for your code to compile to use Max here. Um, I mean, a lot of people implemented that with a, an if statement, which is fine, you know, so 
啊啊，我来搞。Constructors, the destructor. Notice that uh, well, this is common that the destructor. Um, um, you know, we, we allocate memory in the constructor or in some of our member functions. So, but the destructor is called whenever the class goes out of scope. So there, our, our main thing to do, you know, anytime you're doing dynamic memory allocation, often you need a destructor and you need to ensure that you deallocate, you free up the memory that might be being used by your class there. So, so yeah, there's Mac digit. So, you know, my, my implementation is like that, but, but you know, it's fine if, uh, use like an if statement here. So if like this, which points to num digits is greater than um, other dot num digits. Then, you know, you can return, you know, in that case, you want to return this. Uh, else, the other one is the bigger, right? So you want to return. Um, All right. So notice this. I mean, this is maybe the trickiest part was this because here this um, um, is uh, actually a pointer. So you use the the, the pointer dereference to access number digits. Of course, you know I I, I didn't have to do that because again. Uh, if there's no ambiguity, I can just reference num digits. So since I don't have a local parameter named num digits, it's gonna it would assume that you that I mean the um, the class variable num digits, right? So I really don't need that um, in this case. Right? Uh, I think I had it there for readability, you know. So it, it makes it very clear, like this, or uh, using it here, that we're comparing uh, this objects size number of digits to the other object number size again. and here uh, since we pass in other as an actual large integer object actually we, you had to pass it in as a um, reference to a large integer object which I want to discuss real quickly here um, so if you pass in but, but it's 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 really just an instance of an object and that means that you access like, like a structure you, you access um, it's not a pointer it's an actual um, instance of an object to so use the the dot to access member fields like the number of digits, right? But you know, you might ask, um, well, other is um, um, you know, or, or num digits is private here, right? So, but but this is this is valid. So within um, the scope of a function, uh, within the scope of member functions of the large integer class. Um, I can access anything of the class, even of another class. Uh, and that's kind of what the trick is that's, that's being done in this example notation that I gave here, right? So we can directly access the other number, the num digits. Um, the alternative would be uh, we would have to add an accessor uh, function, right? Which we didn't have, but, um, but I would have counted that correct as well if you'd added like a get num digits function and then called other dot get num digits, right? But, but uh, it turns out it'll work that you can just directly access the private variable of other dot num digits. And that, that's what I was doing here in the um, example solution, so. All right, let's see if we're still building. And if we're still running. So um, one thing I mentioned in the um, announcement, uh, so one common mistake, although I helped at least two, maybe three people with this. Um, so if you didn't, weren't reading closely and didn't see about this needing to be a, um, um, a reference, this can cause you problems. And I'm going to, I, I described in the announcement, I'm going to describe again why that can cause you problems. So uh, this will actually compile and run with the tests. So, you know, if, if you look at the tests of the uh, max digits, there's no way to tell whether this is, you know that you're passing in an actual instance rather than a pointer, because I'm passing in L2, L3, L4. But if it gets passed by value or passed by reference is, is going to be the, the difference between whether I do it like that, where it's being passed in by value, or if I add the ampersand to pass it in by reference here, right? So if, if you pass in by value, what you'll see, oops, 
um, I mean, it, it, it should compile fine, but you're going to get some mysterious errors. And, and I don't know if you'll get exactly the same error that I get here, but um, um, oh, unfortunately, we had to compile the test there again. For some reason, I must have saved something there that I didn't mean to. So, uh, so after it recompiles the test, once we run, um, I'll just give the description here. So what happens if you pass this in by value? Remember, by value means that a copy is made. So for this first one, when I call it, a copy of li2 is made, a large integer 2, right? Um, so by a copy, that means um, you end up with two instances, the original one and a copy of it that's uh, only valid within the scope of the max digits function. And it will make a copy of the ID, the number of digits, and the digits. But when it makes a copy of the digits, you get a new integer pointer. So you get a new pointer to the array of memory, but the value that gets filled in here is the same address. So both for your the original li2, um, it's pointing to that address of memory for the, um, um, the value of the digits. And then the copies digits points to the same thing. So you end up having two separate objects two instances of your large integer class, but they're both pointing to the same block of memory to represent their digits, okay? So the result will be, um, if we run the tests, uh, you should get um, like a double free error sometimes. You get some kind of, of, of abortion, um, uh, abort. Um, and um, it can be tough to, um, you know, understand why you're getting that, you know, because it's, it's really just, um, um, all you know is that um, that the program died due to a feral, fatal error condition, okay? So one hint on debugging this, so uh, it, it's not a good idea to rely on the last thing you see before this message as the actual last thing that was run, although in this case that pretty much was because the, the, the problem, I, I haven't completely described it yet, but the problem does occur right there when it tries to run uh, the very first max digits to compare L1, Li1, Li2 here, right? So, so it really did get down to that line. But um, if you are getting um, abnormal termination, so you're getting um, memory corruption, double free, uh, a SIG abort, um, what are some other ones that you can get? Um, um, memory access violation, um, things like that. Anything that's causing a signal um, to, to cause your program to crash, basically. Um, you might want to run the test by hand in that case and use the um, dash s option. So for the dash s, as a reminder, I've shown this before, but the dash s shows both, you know, by default, you only show the, um, the failing tests, right? So if you want to see all the tests, both successful and failing, add in the dash s option. that will guarantee that the last thing that you see um, is the last actual thing that ran, okay? So actually, it, it actually ends up passing a lot of these things and we don't get the a failure um, down to 88, which is actually gonna even be a little bit more um, um, confusing, I know, if, if, if people were getting that, so. Um, although also, you get a better error message here. So this is really a double free problem that, that ends up corrupting memory here, okay? Um, and so let me explain that. So again, when you make, if you pass this in by value, a copy of the objects made, uh, it successfully uses the copy and returns a result, but unfortunately, uh, when you create an object inside the scope of a function, when that function returns, the, 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 the object goes out of scope, and that's when the destructor gets called, okay? So again, remember this other, um, for all of these calls, before it aborted, you know, it got all the way down to this one before uh, something was seen that we had some double free corruption. It mostly got all the way down there because we had accidentally freed up the memory pointed to by L1 and L2. They were both pointing to the same thing. And the next time we tried to use L1, um, it's referring to memory that's no longer valid. Um, and that's where it, where it finds out that double free um, memory corruption is occurring, okay? So yeah, you know, so here when, when this, when all these function calls return from max digits, the, the, the function goes in scope when you first enter the function and then it goes out of scope, that means the construct, the, the destructor is called. 
So basically, you know, back up to the destructor I showed real quickly. Um, this ends up being called. And, and that's why, you know, in fact, we can see that if we uncomment these and try it, which is why I had those in there for people as a hint for people to try some things out on. So uh, it, when this destructor is called, it, it uh, deletes that memory. That means it deallocates it. And unfortunately, that means it's deallocating the same block memory that both of these are pointing to, um, which, which causes problems, right? Well, let's build that again and let's, let's see here. So you, you'll be able to see these um, uh, destructors being called here if, after we build it and run it again. All right, so, so you can see um, after the first test, uh, we entered the destructor on the um, object with an ID of two. So the reason kind of why I had those IDs in there was to help you debug this kind of stuff. So if, if you go back and look in here, uh, you'll find out that the object with ID of two is um, um, the, 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 the L, LI1 and, and um, um, I'm sorry, LI2 has the ID of two, okay? So, so the, the, this object and the copy of the object both end up having the same ID because if you pass by value, you make a copy. Um, and, and yeah, that's the one that, whose destructor is being um, entered, so it frees up the, the memory, but that unfortunately frees it up both for the original object and the copy of the object, causing the problem. And the same thing happened for our one with ID one when, when we call the next one, and eventually we get the double free um, corruption happening here. So, all right. So, I mean, this is this this was a, I left this in kind of on purpose. This is a, a subtle example of the problems um, that you can get when having to manage your own memory, right? And to tell you the truth, this is not the right way to actually solve this problem. Um, although uh, it's fine to pass in objects by reference, and often you actually do pass in objects by reference because lots of, of classes can be really big. So it's kind of the same, the same reason that, that um, arrays are passed in by reference uh, instead of by value by default. You know, you're just passing in the, the base address of the array. Uh, often it's a good idea for objects to, to pass them in by reference as well, especially if you have an object that, that, that's really big, has a large number of, of data in it, or else you end up getting having to copy a lot of data every time you pass that in to a function, um, which can have performance um, implications. Right? But yeah, really, the uh, back to this, um, and I encourage you, people that are interested in this, students that are interested in this, to go back to your textbook. The, the, the correct way probably to actually solve this is to have yet another constructor which is known as a copy constructor. Which would have a signature like this. So basically, whenever, if I was passing this in by value, a copy would be made. And if you define what's known as a copy constructor, where you're passing in a um, reference to an object, um, or I think, I think you have to pass in um, like, like a large, not a reference, but an actual value of an object. I have to check that. Maybe it's it's um, a reference, but anyway, uh, you, you can define what's known as a copy constructor, and then you could do something different. So probably the correct way, if if I am making a copy of an object, is to actually uh, you, you want a new object with a new object ID, but you also definitely want to allocate a new block of digits and then copy the values from the original object into the new uh, uh, block of memory that you allocate for the new set of digits, all right? If, if that makes sense, if you're following me. So, but that would also solve the problem in a better way if, if you have these things that are known as copy constructors, right? So that we explicitly take care of if a copy is being made of my large integer object, that I, you know, if I'm dynamically allocating memory and dynamically managing memory, you really do need to, to take care of that use case where copies are being made of your object to make certain that you're not corrupting memory. Um, like it like can potentially happen in this example here. Um, all right. So let's see, we're not, not building anymore, but I make certain that um, um, X 
certain that I can still get back to a buildable state. Uh, oh, um, I got rid of max digits somehow. Let me just do a clean build. Um, not certain what I got. So, so for me, if I'm getting something that I can't quite understand, it's best to go back. Although we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to. Um, so let's clean that. I have to go back and wait for it to rebuild the test there. But, um, uh, but yeah, I think I'm okay if I just get back to a clean build of everything here. So, um, all right, and then kind of I want to wrap up because we're getting uh, kind of close on the end here. Again, if if anybody has questions or came here to ask questions, you know, feel free to type them out or shout them out, uh, unmute and shout them out. Um, so yeah, um, I did consider it incorrect not to be using dynamic memory allocation for a pen digit. Um, so again, um, I think this was the, the place where somebody had hard coded in uh, like, like a static array to do this calculation, I believe. Um, so anyway, you know, again, to, to, to properly handle the possibility that, that, you know, I can have thousands or millions or tens of millions of digits, you really need to, for this append digit, create a whole new block of memory that's just one bigger. This is a bit inefficient. So if we really wanted to do things efficiently, we might want to do stuff where we allocate things in bigger chunks. We'll talk a little bit more about this, I think, when we talk about more near the end of the course, like um, when we talk about hashing and stuff. So, so you might want to start off, though, with like a fixed size where you can handle up to 10 digits, and then you keep doubling every time, right? So um, if I need, if I grow to bigger than 10 digits, um, I double that, so I have enough room for 20 digits, and then 40, 80. That that if you, if you double the size, you minimize the amount of times you need to be allocating, or, or you greatly reduce the number of times you need to be reallocating memory and doing all this copy, which can be really inefficient, especially if you're working with really huge, large, in, large integers here. So. Um, But, uh, but yeah, if, if you did the dynamic allocation, then, I mean, again, this is kind of similar to the, um, the constructor you had to, to make. So, you know, if, if you allocate enough room to get one bigger, then you're just going to be copying all of the values from your original into the new memory instead of from your parameter into the, to the new one. So from the original into this new block of memory for the new digits and then adding on that, that digit that you're, that you're given. And, and um, um, I think one person had um, uh, uh, an error where they didn't set the, the um, member variable num digits to add one to it, uh, like we did here. Although uh, I think they fixed it in in the in a update that they made before my final grading. So anyway. And then finally, let, let me kind of walk through uh, my implementation of add, uh, and then maybe I'll bring up assignment four here for five minutes. Um, so if you reuse the digit at place, um, max digits, um, and the append digit, you can get a fairly complex, a, a very, uh, a fairly um, compact version of add. Uh, and this was the algorithm that I described that I, that I um, um, suggested. Um, not very few people got exactly this, but although, you know, uh, like I said, maybe, maybe about a third to a half of you got uh, an implementation of ad that was working or mostly working, which is fine, you know, so you got like a 90 or 95 if you got up to but didn't quite get ad going, you know, so and this was by far probably the most difficult. Um, so for one thing, if you reuse max digits, so a lot of people had um, a big if statement here, and they did two essential blocks of code, if statement and then the else statement, that were essentially copies of each other based on, you know, if, if this one's max digits is bigger than the other, um, we just need uh, an array um, that's big enough for this's 
number of digits. Else, if the other one was the bigger, then we need to have an array to hold the result that's the size of the other size of digits. So, so logically, yeah, that, that makes sense. But um, I kind of, I mean, I didn't take any points off this, off this especially if you had it working. But that's, uh, whenever you have code that's basically a repetition, um, you should, I'll, I'll, I'll say this lots of times in people's comments, uh, you should learn the, the dry principle don't repeat yourself. So anytime you have code that's essentially a, a copy of two or more, uh, with just a slight change, um, that's a big red flag that oh, I'm repeating myself. There's some capability to reuse that code and to simplify it. So I, I don't have a copy. So copies are bad because, uh, I mean, just as a, a quick example, if I find a bug and I kind of fix it just in one of those repeated things but not in the other then i fix the bug for the some of the cases but not in the others you know and, and, and there's other reasons why you don't want to have uh, repeated code like that so so yeah if you use max digits you can just figure out you, you don't have to to have uh, you know a condition if or else you figure out which is the actual number of digits that i need to hold my result and again this is the new number of digits or it could be this number plus one if i end up with a carry on the last one. So another way I could have written this is I could have assigned enough memory to hold new, that number of digits plus one just right up front um, and then maybe put like a zero at the front but that might break some things where most of this code is assuming that the the um, the, the digit at the, the most significant digit, the one with the highest magnitude, isn't a zero. So if we end up with a zero on that thing then you might have to go ahead and, and reallocate a new array that's one smaller and copy them from there to there. So there's really no good solution. Uh, the, the purpose of, of the append um, digit was for me was so that uh, the, the, its only real use was if we do end up with a carry, you can just call it um, and, and get that carry on there to, to the resulting um, object. Right? Um, and then here, so one final, thing that I wanted to note. So some people inside their loop, whether they're using like a single loop or like an if else block, but you need a loop that goes through and basically calculates the digits one by one from the least significant place to the most significant place. So that's why it needs to go from zero up because zero is the 10 to the zero or the ones place, right? So if you add this digit and the other digit plus the carry, so the carry is initially zero for the, the, the first digit, your, your ones place digit. But if you add those for the carry, then from that you can figure out what the new digit is and what the carry should be, you know, for, for the next digit. But you can just keep adding those in. Right? Some people, one final thing I wanted to point out, some people instead of using a dynamically allocated array, were repeatedly calling the append digit. So, so instead of creating the result, so dynamically creating a resulting object to return, afterwards they created it beforehand with and initially just using the the default constructor so with a single digit with a value of zero um, and then we're just calling um, a pinned digit um, although if you did that I have to go back and remember how they did how people did that you have to be careful about you know your first so you have to really calculate your ones digit first and create a new object with that ones digit and then have a loop to calculate the tens, hundreds, thousand digit. And then if you keep appending them though, um, as I mentioned at that, if you keep calling a pin digit, so on the one hand, you know, it was nice to see people reusing functions um, in, in a way, not exactly the way I had originally intended, but that's good, you know, uh, practicing using reuse, code reuse. Um, but, um, the problem with that is, is append digits is very, um, if you implement it, it uh, the, the, the way that the algorithm that's given for you for it, it, it's very inefficient, right? So it's an O, it's an O N, big, big O N, but, but it's kind of worse because not only do you have to, to loop through all in digits and copy them from the original to the new, uh, you also have this dynamic memory allocation, which can be kind of expensive, right? And, um, you know, if, if you only do it once, um, I mean, that's one thing, although it's still not great, but if you're doing it like inside, if you're pending digits, every time you do the, the calculation, the next thing you're calling this many, many times. So uh, you end up with an O in square because inside of the add, that's an O in operation to add up 
the, the in digits, and we'll talk about big O notation uh, in coming weeks here, um, but you're calling a pin digit, which is also uh, a, a big O of n um, complexity. So that, that changes your add into an n squared. Um, so the upshot is, is it'll be significantly slower. So if I try to add two digits with millions of digits, uh, an implementation like that is going to go lots, lots slower. It'll be noticeably slow compared to this, which is really still O N um, because this loop happens in times and then afterwards, if we have to append the carry, uh, it's another end, so it ends up being two N, but that's what's known as big, it still it has a time complexity of, of N in, in, in the number of digits that you have in the biggest of these two. All right, so yeah, those are the, the kind of things that I want to talk about uh, for assignment three for free if you have some questions to shout those out. Um, so I'd actually kind of wanted to do a little bit more to, to get started with assignment four, but but we'll do we'll do this some significant on assignment four questions um, and maybe show getting started on it um, on on Wednesday. Uh, but let me just talk for three or more minutes about that before I stop the video here. So, I think people, uh, students, uh, will find assignment four, uh, and maybe the next one, maybe not the next one, but we'll find this one maybe uh, a little bit less time consuming than the previous one or two assignments. Um, um, one thing about assignment four, so uh, we're, 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 uh, you're learning about the concept of recursion, okay? Um, and um, I'll, you know, I'll feel, feel free to, uh, answer questions about recursion, um, or you can email me. Or definitely, we can get into this a lot more on Wednesday, right? But uh, for one thing, I want to point out is uh, we're we're not doing classes again, okay? So really, we're back to just writing straightforward functions like you did for the first assignment. And in this case, you really only have um, was it just two? No, you have four functions that you have to write. So you have to write. Um, Um, two versions of factorial, uh, the, uh, an iterative version where you're not using recursion. So you do that first for your task one, right? So your first version is just going to be using a loop, probably the normal way. And, 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 and in fact, I think even, I, I think that I wrote a factorial iterative, uh, I already wrote this for you in the um, lecture videos for this week. So you can probably find the implementation if, if you're a little bit, uh, don't know exactly how to, to write an iterative version of that, but basically, you know, if you want the factorial of n, you just have to take n times n minus one times n minus two, dot dot dot, till you get down to one. Right? That's that's what the definition of the factorial is. If you've never run across that, I didn't I didn't discuss that um, in here, so I kind of assumed that you knew what the factorial was. I think. So, um, but um, yeah, your task is, and again, this is just a regular function. So you don't have any classes, and this isn't a member function. It's just a straight C, C++ function. Um, and then you need to re-implement that as a recursive function. Right? And then the same for, for count combinations. Um, you're going to write a, um, a non-recursive version and then a recursive version. right? And so your first version should be reusing your factorial function. Um, because there's uh, it uses the factorial in the definition of how to calculate the number of combinations of uh, n choose uh, x things or however many we, n choose i um, items, right? Um, so yeah, for that one, I mean, basically, if you've got a function that can calculate factorial, and and you can either reuse your iterative or your um, recursive, either one, but just pick one. But but yeah, if if you call function where you say I've got n items choose i, you have to do the calculation of you just take calculate the factorial of n, divide that by the factorial of i times the factorial of n minus i, and, and i is always going to be less than or equal to n. You know? So so four choose two is just four factorial divided by um, two factorial times two factorial because you know n minus i is four minus two or two again, right? So and and I kind of walk through uh, those in there. Um, all right, so yeah, I'm gonna have to go. To, I'm gonna have to stop the session um, at this point. Um, hopefully, 
um, that gives you some ideas on how to get started for assignment four. Like I said, I think this one will be a little bit less time consuming uh, for most people, but we'll see. Um, yeah, and as usual, if you have questions, um, you know, feel free to email me. I ask usually that uh, go ahead and include your code uh, and also include like the output um, from you're doing your make build if you're having a compile problem that you need some help with or the, the output from your run from running your test if, if your test if you're compiling but you're having some problem getting a test to pass right um, and, and I use you really need to do you need to copy paste the output of this so I mean a screenshot is much less you know so if I want the output of running your test showing both the successful and unsuccessful test you should scroll all the way up here copy all of that so I can see everything and paste that into a message um, and email it to me. So. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm gonna have to go ahead and stop the session for now. Um, and um, yeah, and hopefully that is enough for everybody to get going and I will see you guys on Wednesday then with questions about the fourth assignment.